we're going to continue our discussion of stationary time series by talking about autoregressive models. So when we have zero correlation, we have some estimation procedures we can consider. Number one, we could just use a least squares estimator. Um, number two, we could move into an autoregressive model. All right, so we've already started that a little bit by adding lags of other variables. And I notice I sp spelled autoregressive, so sorry about that. Get rid of that. Um, by, by adding lags of another variable, but we can add lags of the dependent variable of the dependent variable and get into these auto regressions. So auto meaning self regressive models. And then finally, we can start dealing with some of the nonlinearity stuff by using a nonlinear least squares at fetch. In this um, chapter and in this lecture, we're going to focus on number two, the auto regressive models. So, but before we get going, we can talk a little bit about least squares. What's going on with least squares? What if we just use least squares? Well, we still have an unbiased estimator, but it's not the best one anymore. Basically, when we have serial correlation, we've got pattern in the error terms and we're throwing information away. All right, so there's information there that we're throwing away. And so what we really should be doing is trying to figure out a way to get that information. Um, it's still an unbiased estimator though just not going to be the best unbiased estimator. Um, and finally, the standard errors, they're just wrong. So we have to we have to use a proper um, heteroskedasticity autocorrelation consistent um, formulation for the standard errors. Those robust standard errors for, in the presence of serial correlation, um, look at the previous lecture and we talk about how to do that. Okay, so what is an autoregressive model? Basically, it's this. I take and I regress a variable on lags of itself. Now notice I don't have yt over here because then I have yt regressed on yt and that would be just stupid, so we don't do that. Um, but I have yt regressed on a yt minus one, a yt minus two, all the way up to yt minus p. So we could consider the following model. Take this and apply it to GDP growth. We knew there was a little bit of serial correlation, we think, in the GDP growth um, statistic. And so let's look at that. Let's just, we've got a constant here, and then we'll put in here a lag of growth and then two lags of growth. And that's just an autoregressive model of GDP growth. Um, and the thing about these autoregressive models is they're extremely, extremely simple, but the thing is they can be really, really, really devastatingly hard to beat in terms of model fit and model forecasting, uh, much to the chagrin of many young forecasters who have tried to do so. It can be a real challenge. So let's take a brief example. Okay, so we load our data. We've talked about that. We put it in a time series. We've talked about that in the previous two um, um, lectures talk about how this time series function works, but that's basically going to change this data frame, Oaken, into a time series. And then we're going to estimate an autoregressive model. And we can use this dynamic LM function to do that. And it's pretty simple. We're just going to take G, which is the growth rate inside of this Oaken.ts, and regress that on lags of G. But notice there's no zero in here. If we put a zero in here, then we get a perfect fit. Everything else would be insignificant because we'd be regressing the variable on itself. And well, that doesn't work. So we don't want to do that. Um, but we're going to regress it on lags of itself. So one lag, two lags. And that tells us what the data is. And then we just use, we're going to use conf test to spit out what the coefficients are and their standard error and t value. Now notice we haven't done any changes to the variance covariance matrix yet to do hack standard errors. Um, we just haven't done that yet. Um, we should probably do some testing to make sure to see whether or not we need to do that. Okay, the next big challenge when we talk about a, uh, an AR model is, well, how many lags do we include? Well, there's a few ways that we can do that. I'm going to show you three that I think are reasonable. Um, well, two that are pretty standard, one that's a little bit weird, but there's no huge reason why it shouldn't work. It's just not very well used, it's not very often used. Um, 
and we might talk about a brief reason as to why maybe it's not very often used. Okay, and so what we're going to do here is uh, let me talk about what we're doing here. So we've got I've set up these three just empty matrices. They're just big our uh, big vectors that have zeros in them. Okay. Um, then so basically that means repeat zero five times. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from i equals one to five, and I'm going to estimate the model using that many lags. So the first time it's going to go through here and it's going to one to one. So it's going to do one lag. Okay. And it's going to tell it to start at I because if we don't start at I, then we'll lose. We, we have missing observations. So that's what we're going to do. Then we're going to come down here and for the ith, we're going to put in the AIC, the BIC, and then we're going to get the test statistic from the BG test. Now, the, the Bush Godfrey test is testing for serial correlation. All right, and so that's what we're doing. The first one is, we, the first two, we're using information criteria. The second one is, we just want to test, are there any, uh, is there any serial correlation in the error terms? Okay. So we'll keep going. All right, so now what we're going to do is, we're going to put all that data together into a table. And then I'm just going to name the, the columns of the table, one, two, three, four, five, to go along with the lags. And then I'm going to name the rows, AIC, BIG, uh, BIC, and BG test stat, um, so that I, I know what I'm looking at. Um, and then I'm just going to spit out the table. You know, no big. And I get this table. And so all of that stuff is just displaying what's here. And so if I use AIC, I want to minimize AIC, and I see big, smaller, smaller, small, bigger. Okay, so AIC wants four lags. BIC, big, small, bigger, bigger, bigger. BIC wants two lags. Okay, that's typical. BIC tends to go for a small model. AIC tends to be a larger model. Okay, um, uh, AIC will usually want more lags. BIC will usually want fewer. Then we can look at this BG test. Now, one of the things that if I have serial correlation, a standard remedy for that is to simply add a um, add the uh, a lag of the dependent variable, and I can keep adding lags of those dependent variables until the serial correlation goes away. So one thing that one might think to do is simply, all right test for serial correlation. So here's with one lag, I test with serial correlation and I reject the null hypothesis that there's no serial correlation. So I go on to two lags. Here, I fail to reject the null hypothesis that there are two, there's serial correlation. And so, forgive me. Oh, come on. There you go. I select two lags because that is the minimum number of lags such that I um, reject the null hypothesis, I fail to reject the null hypothesis of, of no autocorrelation. I, you know, that's, I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to proceed. One problem with it might be is that, you know, we're doing more than one test. And when we do more than one test on the data, the, the you know, the, the probability distributions get a little more complicated. And so essentially what we might be doing is cherry picking. Um, and so I think that might be a reason why we don't use that as much. Um, I still like the idea of testing the error terms for whatever model you come up with for serial correlation. And if it's got serial correlation, you know, you better add another lag. Um, so in any event, I think those three are, are possibilities, though I will say this, AIC and BIC are pretty standard ways of doing this. This one, less so. Um, there's a few other things that you could do, um, but I'm not really going to hit those because they are more non-standard. Okay, so let's do an example. Here's Oaken's Law, and we're going to do a full Oaken's Law. All right, so what we have here is we have the first difference of the unemployment rate, we're going to add a lag of the unemployment rates, and we're going to have lags of um, um, GDP growth. So what do we have? We have the intercept. We have 
the lag of the difference of unemployment, and we have GDP growth and one lag of GDP growth. That's our model. And everything looks significant. So let's go ahead. We'll plunge ahead. We'll look at the um, fits. You know, I have to admit they don't look that much different than what we saw in the previous um, model from the previous um, lecture. Um, we still see some of these straight lines, which always makes me nervous. But overall, it's not the absolute end of the world. So let's do a little more analysis. Let's go ahead and let's test for serial correlation. And with up to one lag for serial correlation, we find we fail to reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation. So we don't find day evidence of serial correlation of up to order one. We do the same thing up to order four. So we go back one year. And again, big P value, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation. So again, we don't find any um, evidence that serial correlation is an issue with our error terms.